Kristen Krabel, who's our presenter for today. And so you can go ahead to, to and introduce yourselves in the chat box. Let me just give a little bit of, of housekeeping. Um, so your microphones are muted. Um, the chat box there, you can see where I've already put in a few things. You can type into the chat box if you have a question or a comment or to let us know where you're coming from. Um, at the end of this session or even during it, if you've got questions, you can certainly email us at newengland at mhccnetwork.org and we'll put that email up at the end as well. Um, and the session is being recorded and will be posted on the MHCCC uh, website usually within 24 hours after the presentation. So I'm going to let Ken introduce himself here in a minute while I go through after I go through all of the MHCCC um, slides here. But the New England Mental Health Technology Transfer Center is a collaboration between the Yale Program for Recovery and Community Health. Um, and C4 Innovations, which is where Ken and I are from, and also the Harvard Department of Psychiatry and the Center for Educational Improvement. And our goal is to support the behavioral health workforce in New England and help institute best practices. Uh, we come to you all with a recovery-oriented, uh, resilience-focused way of approaching this work, which you'll hear a lot of in today's uh, presentation. We work to make sure everything we do is inclusive. You'll hear a lot of that throughout all of our offerings. Um, I'm going quickly because we got started late, but I, so I won't say more about that here. And the slides are not advancing. Um, so maybe I won't say anything at all. Um, so let's see. Uh, we've got uh, two people supporting us on technology today, Adrian and Vanessa, and I think one of them is going to switch over the slides, and I am going to turn it over to Ken. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Katie. And hello, everyone. I'm uh, coming to you from Seattle, where it's trying to be sunny today. Uh, it is July, after all, so we would expect some sun. Those of you in New England, I understand that you've not been uh, you, you've been having some stormy weather as well. But thank you for joining. Uh, these are indeed extraordinary times. I actually struggled with the title for this presentation. What do we call it, right? And, and so I'm kind of curious what you all would have said in place of extraordinary. Uh, I mean, that might work for you, but there might be other words that you would use. So I'm just curious if you were to have titled these times that we're living in, uh, what might have you put in there? Uh, you know, things that come to mind are, uh, things like maddening or uh, totally unpredictable. Uh, what, what else have you got uh, as you're joining in here and putting your fingers to the keyboard? Unprecedented, yes, at least in our lifetime. Flexible, yeah, they're flexible times. We're absolutely needing to learn to do that. Uh, other, other thoughts I'd love to see just in a word or a phrase? Challenging for sure, Talisha, yeah, for sure, challenging. Um, yeah, stressful, very stressful, trying. So, so these are times that uh, I, I don't know that we've ever had a confluence of things come together as they are here. So thank you very much, and I'm sure there are other words and things you might add. Um, just by way of brief introduction, I am a social worker by background. I've worked in the homelessness and mental health and behavioral health arena for most of my life. Uh, more recently, in the last 20 years or so, I've been doing more developing curricula and doing teaching and training around best practices and working with marginalized populations. So that includes things like trauma-informed care, motivational interviewing, different forms of uh, case management and, and uh, supervision and, and those kinds of things. But today we're going to talk about how do we support staff in these times. And so I'm going to make some assumptions here that each of you is likely coming from a place where you have some kind of oversight responsibility. Either you're a supervisor, a program manager, you might be a CEO or CFO, uh, a, a board member, but you're coming to the desire to dive in a little bit and see how we can take care of folks in the best way we know how. And, and I'll just say this up front, too. Um, I am very confident that each of you is already supporting staff in very creative, interesting ways 
And that being the case, I hope you'll share those ways in the chat box as we move ahead. Um, I'll share some ideas as well, but this way we can learn from one another. So this was described in, in if you looked at the literature in, in advance, of how do we stay grounded and focused during these times? How do we bring forth our humanity and our strengths in supporting people? Uh, what's challenging? What do people need? How do we listen and respond? Uh, and, and so that's a big bill for an hour-long webcast, but, but that's kind of the foundation from which I'm working here and using these learning objectives as a, a way to frame the conversation. <clears throat> so I want to start here, and I don't know if you can read the fine print, but this is a, a painting, of course, uh, that represents an apocalyptic situation. And I think the word apocalypse is entirely appropriate for these times, not because it's the end times or because it, it's, this is it. <laughs> uh, it. It's more that the, the term apocalypse literally uh, means in its root meaning uh, unveiling or uncovering or revealing something. And I, I think what's happening during these times, even though that might be a bit overstated in terms of the graphic imagery, these are indeed times when things are being unveiled, uncovered, in, in ways that uh, they're not new, but they're much heightened. And of course, one of those things is around <coughs> uh, race and, and racism. And uh, here's an image, of course, of uh, not that long ago in this country, uh, people were selling other humans and purchasing them and owning them and controlling them. And this whole idea of whiteness was a construct that was construct that was developed uh, actually to to develop that ability to control others. Um, we also know that this is a time when there's great pain. There has been great pain for a long time. But I I read this quote to you from the Seattle Times about a week ago. Uh, a woman says, "As a black woman, I can't ever stop thinking of racism. It's not a choice. It's my reality." I think about the murder of black people every morning. When I wake up, when I leave my house, when I jog around white neighborhoods, when I see blue red blur of police cars, it's like if I wasn't thinking about being black, I don't know what I would think about. Maybe fresh air or freedom or something lighthearted. I'd think of jogging or walking, maybe babysitting a loved one or falling asleep. Nothing violent is what I would want to dream about or think about. But the fact is that it's there. And so, again, we're all being faced uh, with our own, regardless of where we're coming from, we, we recognize this is a time when uh, there's a lot of truth telling taking place, and necessarily so. And of course, these images, I trust, uh, are unfortunately familiar to us, and I hope this image also and others uh, are suggesting that there is an uprising taking place, and that's a good thing. And so in the midst of the chaos and the turbulence and the really hard stories, there's also this recognition that we've got to pay more attention, got to do better. So there's that, and then there's this. And I, I look at this image and I just think, wow, what a beautiful image. Uh, it, it looks almost like it could be a play toy of some sort, but it's not. It's, it's a coronavirus, right? It's COVID-19, and it's wreaking havoc in our country, uh, especially in these times right now. And we're, we're talking about the possibility at this point of maybe upwards to 100,000 people a day being infected with it and a tremendous uprise in deaths. And so there's that. And, of course, we're having to change the way we do things. And uh, protect ourselves. And so all of this is going on, right? And, and then there's just the regular chaos that happens in uh, the way that people are trying to address and deal with this. And, and oftentimes it leaves us, I think, in, in a space of just feeling sort of, I, I don't know what words you would use. I, I see an image here that is sort of stoic, frozen in place, um, kind of pained. Uh, I, I, you're welcome to add other words. But, but in this image, I think I'm seeing something that probably impacts all of us, 
when we're not all frenzied or upset, that we, we kind of shut down oftentimes in the face of so much craziness and chaos. And, and that's why supporting staff during these times is such a critical thing to do, because this is happening to us oftentimes, and it's happening to the people uh, who are providing services that we oversee, and it's also happening to the people receiving services and, and people everywhere else. So the reminder here is that in times like these, self-care and team care are vital to our well-being. And so I share this quote with you from Desmond Tutu, who was asked, what do you do in times of despair? And his response was, you show your humanity. So everything we talk about from here on out, I, I trust will be a way of showing our humanity in its fullness. And I don't know what that means to you, but to me, showing our humanity means showing everything good about us, but also everything challenging and everything hard. And so it's warts and all, uh, but it's also coming forward with our best intentions and our best practices. And of course, each of us shows our humanity in different ways. But uh, I came across this quote, which I, I so appreciate. You know, we, we aren't able to choose being human, but we can certainly and need to choose how we keep our humanity alive and, and well. And so those of you who are leaders in organizations, I trust that you are doing everything you can to put your humanity out front and center. Leadership is not a position. It's not a title. It is action and example. I think this is attributed to Cory Booker, but it, it, it's been a sort of something I've seen in a lot of various forms. But I, I can't accentuate enough that as leaders, as supervisors, uh, as CEOs, whatever your position, your actions absolutely will speak much louder than your words and your example. And so that's a big part of what, what I think supporting staff is all about. It's less about what we say, although words are important too, but it's really how we choose to live congruently and with integrity as we move forward. So I'm curious if you might type in the chat box, what, what are you facing? And, and be as specific as you can. What, what are you noticing that is hard in supporting staff in these extraordinary times. And it might be hard for you. It might be hard for staff themselves because the things they're wrestling with. So, so feel free to share broadly here. But what's coming up for you in the here and now that you're just uh, you're noticing and feeling a need to address? So I'm seeing the isolation and not being together, the lack of being able to be socially present to one another. Absolutely stressed out about race and, and COVID, uh, absolutely, and, and a lack of direction from government, sort of a, if anything, a lack of, of showing uh, by leading by example in many ways, right? Uh, trying to cope when we ourselves are feeling out of control. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to do. Um, and, and then uh, home with no privacy to, to do your work in, which actually impacts things like confidentiality and noise control and all those things, and it's another form. Uh, again, racial tensions, constantly changing policies and procedures because they have to change. Tech problems, absolutely, we, I can speak to that well. Um, and, and you want to meet with people face-to-face -face because you know there's a real healing rhythm in doing that, and yet we can't do that right now. And Jody, you talk about living in Minneapolis. You know, people worried about safety, about criminal justice, behavioral health issues. I mean, it's just opening up a whole cauldron of things that have always been there, but, but they're coming to light in new ways. And I will say that as hard as that can be, as a white person, I'm also finding it uh, something that I, I feel like there, there's something valuable happening. There's a new way of seeing and learning that I'm ha having to experience as well as people around me. And I, I only trust that this will lead to more lasting changes and certainly not a return to the normal we used to experience, what, whatever that was. So thank you for sharing. Uh, I, I think that I want to share now with you a few things in terms of what we know from research about what staff need. And this is coming from 
the Gallup poll people who have been looking at supervision, leadership, and other forms of leadership for uh, many, many years. And they actually wrote a book in the early 2000s called First Break All the Rules. <clears throat> and so I realized in looking at this slide, it looks like what staff need is to first break all the rules. And that's not exactly my intention. Uh, but there are certain rules that we all need to break for sure uh, so that we don't stay with con con the conventional wisdom uh, that, that sometimes we live with. And so I'm going to share with you a few things that come out of that research. And just to note that these things were actually identified during so-called normal times. But now more than ever, I think these are critical. And one of those questions is, do I know what is expected of me at work? Now, Somebody just mentioned changing procedures and policies. Absolutely, they're changing. And, and so do we and are we keeping people informed about what's expected? Uh, do people know how to be both safe as well as being able to be in connection with people? Do they know how to work virtually? Is there training around that? Or is there sharing of ideas? Um, do they know how to maintain confidence do they know how to deal with mental health crises? Uh, do they know how to communicate, over-communicate even? Um, and, and what does productivity look at like these days? Uh, I, I think this is all, uh, and I, I guess I would say this about productivity. Um, I, I think that we have been so focused historically on outcomes and numbers and results. And I think this is a really good time to call into question that kind of productivity and instead look at processes and methodologies and, and how we're moving in a direction, not, not necessarily though looking at the exact outcome. Another big question is, do I have the materials and equipment I need to do my work right? Uh, I know in my case and others, uh, you know, we've had to go out and get equipment or the organization has provided equipment or but we've had to change up how we do things, right? Uh, I'm just looking at a few things in the chat box. Uh, staff seem burned out. Consumers don't want to be on the phone, and therefore productivity is down, which impacts our bottom line. So there's the reimbursement piece, absolutely, that also plays in. And we need to be looking at new ways of reimbursing activities that we didn't used to reimburse for, I do believe. <clears throat> so another few things that staff need is at work do you have the opportunity to do what I do best every day and what we're really talking about here is people come with various talents and interests and skills and if they're not able to practice what they do best and are best at on a regular basis they're going to become bored or unhappy and unsatisfied and the fact is that during COVID during these times people have had to take on new responsibilities or take on new tasks and sometimes that's both been uh, disheartening and other times it's actually been a, a really positive thing because some people are taking on new leadership, leadership tasks or they're branching out into an area that uh, you didn't know about before. But I think this is an opportunity for all of us to be uh, learning and growing and <clears throat> developing further as we go. In the last seven days, have I received recognition or praise for doing good work? Now, more than ever, we need to be acknowledging people's intentions, strengths, and all of the things they're doing to stay centered and focused and do their work as well as possible. And so this is a time, certainly, for affirming people's ability to show up, right, and to be present and to do their best. And if people are able to accomplish certain things, that's great too. But really, this is a time to just say thanks for hanging in there. Thanks for your efforts. Thanks for your, your, your good efforts to, to keep this going. Uh, and I know how hard it is. This has to be genuine, of course, and it has to be sincere. We're not talking about cheerleading. We're just talking about noticing and acknowledging what people are doing. Does my supervisor or someone at work seem to care about me as a person? Again, I would say now more than ever, uh, this is a time when we have to be able to not just as supervisors and leaders treat people as 
a productivity machine, but treat them as individuals who come with their own trauma, with their own anxiety, with their own uh, distractions, et cetera, as, as you all know. Uh, but I think increasingly I'm finding in my own supervisory sessions, both on the giving and receiving ends, there's more talk, talk about how are you doing? And, and, and we're asking that these days in a way that isn't just how are you doing, it's how are you doing? How are you doing these days? And, and, and seeking a, a real genuine response because this is a time for us to get to know one another at a deeper level and recognize we are human beings doing the work of human services and being human and showing your humanity is a really critical part of this. <clears throat> the sixth one is there's someone at work who encourages your development. So interestingly, I find that during these times, it's not about treading water necessarily, although some of it's that. It's maintaining the status quo in some ways and doing the best you can. But this is also a really wonderful time to be potentially learning new areas of knowledge and expertise and skills. Uh, because there is a certain slowdown that has happened to the pace of life and the pace of our work. And I think it affords us the ability to go and be on uh, webcasts like this or take courses online or to read more and to learn more about trauma and trauma-informed care, to learn more about racism and racial equity, to learn more about motivational interviewing, about different forms of uh, therapeutic styles and so on. So there are six more, and I'm not going to focus on them so much because those first six, I think, are particularly critical. But uh, people still need to know if your opinions count at work and whether the mission of the company still makes you feel good about your job. We also still need to know how we can keep doing quality work, uh, have people who are uh, best friends, meaning people who you can turn to when things are really hard. And I hope each of you has somebody like that in your work setting. It may be your supervisor or and or it may be somebody else as well. And has somebody been talking to you about your progress and, and so on and so forth? So Sarah, you say, what if your leadership does not acknowledge that anything is different right now? <sighs> um, I invite other people to respond, but uh, what a sad, sad situation. Uh, and and it, it's a failure of leadership, in my view, to, to not even acknowledge that things have changed. And uh, to, to, if there's an expectation that things will keep going as usual, productivity will continue as usual, everything will roll on, then um, I'll just say that leadership probably needs to be educated and need, we, we, you need to advocate, you and others, uh, for what's happening on the ground. Um, that, that's a, a really sad chasm between leadership and what's really happening. I hope others of you who are in similar situations uh, are, are finding ways to address that. So bringing it up in supervision, absolutely, and having those difficult supervision uh, difficult conversations. Uh, we talk about, you know, difficult conver or courageous conversations around race. Well, we can have courageous conversations about lots and lots of things. Thank you for asking. Uh, I'm sorry that's your experience currently. So how do we prepare ourselves for leading and supporting others in these times? And I'm focusing on preparing because so much of our leadership is attitudinal and it's based on what in motivational interviewing we call a mindset and a heart set. Uh, again, this is how we come forward at times like these and, and recognize that uh, what is happening and telling the truth about what is happening. And one of the things I find really critically important is that we remind ourselves that being mindful is a critical part of all of this. And many of you hear the word mindful and you think of all kinds of different things. Here I'm really just talking about stepping back, slowing down, paying attention, focusing on what's going on, and uh, the idea of just paying attention on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally to what's happening. There's something really powerful about that and mindful versus mindful 
of course, is a, a, a clever kind of way of making this distinction. But one of the things that happens, we know, in times like these, where we're in traumatic times and our bodies are literally keeping the score, as Bessel van der Kolk says, that our bodies are revved up. There's more, there's more stress hormones going through our, our bodies. And so we're feeling more tense. We're sweating more. Our heart rates are going up. Our blood pressure is going up. All of these things are happening, and we're worrying more. And so one of the antidotes to that is to self-regulate as best we can by bringing down our physical reactions and by being self-soothing and bringing our minds to a place of greater focus. I trust that you all have some kind of mindful practices, even if they're, they might be formal in the, in the way of meditation practice, but they might also be just different ways of taking time aside to pay attention non-judgmentally to what's happening. You know, mindfulness is, is really this idea of uh, being here now, as Ram Dass said. It also shows us what is happening in our bodies in our emotions, in our minds, and in the world. And Thich Nhat Hanh, who I, I really value his wisdom, a Buddhist monk, says, you know, through mindfulness we avoid harming ourselves and others. And certainly doing no harm right now is a, a really critical piece of what we need to pay, pay attention to. Uh, in addition to doing no harm, hopefully we're actually doing a lot of good. Lori says, our company purchased access to Headspace for all staff. It's been a tremendous resource and support. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah, there are lots of different ways to promote this kind of mindfulness practice, including incorporating it into our team meetings, into our supervisory sessions, and into our sessions with clients and, and spending time with them, uh, just slowing down, focusing, uh, finding some self-regulation. Self so I'm going to share four things, and I uh, want to just acknowledge uh, Kristen Paquette's contribution to this, uh, this next set of slides, uh, who is the CEO at C4 Innovations, where I work. But one of these things is to affirm, acknowledge, affirm, and create safe and supportive spaces. And so, again, noticing, recognizing that the neurobiological effect of our both single and collective trauma is impacting our concentration and productivity. I, I like to say these days, uh, your brain's just not working right. And I mean that for myself as well as for everyone else. I, I just like to walk around basically and say, okay, I'm being forgetful. I'm doing crazy, stupid things. Uh, other people are being forgetful. They're not really. And, and the fact is that we're all a, a little bit uh, uh, well, we're very, we're very much impacted, but uh, our, our minds literally are not operating properly because of the way that stress affects the brain. And, and the brain is not allowing us to gain full access to our prefrontal cortex that does a lot of the executive function thinking for us. So let's just acknowledge that. Let's also assume that staff need support, whether or not they express it. In fact, I would be most concerned about staff who say, oh, I'm good, I'm great, I don't need anything, particularly if that's an ongoing response. Uh, I think it's worth our while to probe that a bit. Uh, yeah, Ruben, we're, we're reasonable people in a very unreasonable situation. So true, so true. And we can be forgiving of ourselves as a result of that, I think. So how do we create space in an ongoing way to counter the isolation and to connect, support, share, and talk, particularly around mental health? And, and I'm going to say behavioral health in general because this applies to people's use of substances as well as, as the different ways that mental health uh, manifests itself. And I, I think we all recognize that there's good stress, negative stress, toxic stress, and then there's post-traumatic stress disorder. I mean, stress comes in many different forms. And right now, I think what we're realizing is there's a lot of traumatic, toxic stress that we're experiencing in the world and in our lives. And this is a reality. And so how do we promote employee support? And so Jody's comment, you know, about uh, providing uh, these different uh, tools to help us be more mindful, and, and others uh, is critically important. 
please, in the chat box, continue to share as you wish uh, other ideas that, that you are, that are happening in your own uh, situations. So as a leader, I think it's really critical to set a tone and be a model for openness, compassion, generosity, and self-care. And these are words that are easily received but not always easily practiced. But um, th these are things, I think, to bear in mind. A few more things. I'm going to speed up a little bit. Uh, let's encourage people to make the most of their time off and, and not be work-related. Uh, it's easy for many of us because we're so committed to our work to become sort of super committed at times like these when in fact the best thing we can do for ourselves, for our company, and for others is actually to take time away and rejuvenate. Uh, communicate regularly and be careful to not only acknowledge or lift up staff who are going above and beyond, which we too often reward actually even though there are times that that's helpful and important. But really, let's reward people who are taking time off, who are taking time to stay collected, stay calm, to keep their head above water, uh, even if they're, they're not being as productive. I think that sets a tone. That's an important messaging coming from us as leaders. Any other thoughts around that? Uh, just chime in, anything you've got around this idea of creating safety, awareness, uh, really seeing life as it is. And it's this mindfulness practice of, of being truthful and open about what's going on and responding in a generous, compassionate way. So as you're typing, I'll just uh, I, I'll share these slides with you because there's probably more here than we're going to get to cover. But there are lots of sort of questions that we might use as a starting point for further conversation. I want to go to another aspect of this, and this idea of sharing your, your vulnerability. What, what might be the benefits of sharing your vulnerability? And, and maybe it would be helpful if I said a few things about vulnerability. Um, many of you know the work of Brene Brown, for instance, and, and others. But the idea here is that we're showing our humanity. We're showing who we are, both in terms of what we're good at, our strengths, but that's not the only part of us. We are also people who have deficits and we have areas of needing to grow and we have our shortcomings. And, and there's something here about coming forward in your full humanity as a leader that can be very comforting, that can be very assuring. Now, I do think there are some fine lines here because if we come forward in our vulnerability to the extent that we start dumping our personal problems on people, uh, that, that's not what I'm suggesting here, uh, because then that creates almost a, another layer and level of trauma. But people don't need to see you as fully competent, fully in control, fully capable, because everyone knows in their heart that you're not that. And so it's a false presentation, I do believe, that we need to get over and recognize that we are much stronger when we are being vulnerable with one another. So what might that look like? Well, being authentic, being compassionate, acknowledging when we don't have the answers, acknowledging when we don't know everything, sharing some of the challenges and how you're managing, and also sharing some of the ways that you are finding helpful in how you're managing. Being transparent and open, especially about unknowns. Um, I don't know whether we're going to be back working out of offices. I don't know what it's going to look like in the, in the future uh, to have an organization like ours. I don't know if we're going to function in the same way. I don't know if we're going to have the same amount. You know, and a lot of fears right now are around funding and, and people maintaining their jobs. We don't know. There's just a lot we don't know. And false promises, of course, are less than helpful. Certainly providing as much updated, correct information in as timely a fashion as possible is absolutely critical. And a few more things. Uh, acknowledge that we're all affected. And we are all peers in this experience right now we're having together. We're all people with lived experience. 
uh, of, of these times. And then, of course, on top of that, there's often an overlay of other things going on as well. So I'm just uh, taking a, a little detour, looking at the chat box here a little bit. Uh, sorry, I'm missing a few things, but uh, our staff are feeling like we are being contradictory. We encourage them to take time off, and they still need to produce. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, you know, those two things do live together. Uh, and and I, I guess I would say in response to that, that I, I think the messaging is, is that people are more likely to be productive in a quality way when they take time off. It, it would be like sleeping. If, if people didn't take time to sleep, imagine what life would be like for somebody. Um, and so they may seem contradictory, but I would just suggest that rather than contradicting or fighting each other, they're actually, it's kind of a both and situation where both of those things are true at the same time and both need to be attended to. And that's, you know, that, that's a different way of thinking rather than this binary kind of uh, it's either that or this kind of thing. But thank you for bringing that up. And taking time, as Dayan says, taking time to be considered as protecting your personal self so you can be more present. I guess you just said what I just was trying to say in a lot more words. Uh, and Laura says, when I shared specific information to help people understand my situation and why I act in certain ways. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for that. And so, yes, uh, it's also important that we recognize that while we're all peers in this, we are not equal in, our, in the way we're receiving all this. And we know, again, going back to race and gender and sexuality and, and, and sexual orientation and all of these things that people are being disproportionately affected by these times in terms of COVID, in terms of racism, in terms of all these things. So we need to recognize that for some of us, like myself, uh, I live with a tremendous amount of white privilege that um, is just is. And, and being aware of that is, I think, critically important in naming it as well. Again, I invite your continued thoughts on these things. Um, a third area of principle here is promoting flexibility and gentleness. And so this can manifest, I think, in a lot of different ways. Uh, certainly alternative schedules. I imagine many people are already working, if possible, uh, and managing, you know, balancing that with managing family and household responsibilities and, and all that that includes. Uh, I imagine many of you working remotely. Some are going into the office. Some of you are having direct contact uh, on a limited basis, perhaps, but uh, it's a whole new way of working in our world today. Um, and then helping people to, to set up so they can work flexibly and uh, productively from home. So I think what is true today might not be true tomorrow or next week or the next week because continually things are changing. And so uh, I, I think it's just important to recognize that change is the constant here. And I think this calls for, therefore, more space for supervision and support. Now, that can be informal, but I want to say a word about supervision here. Supervisors, you've heard the saying probably that people join organizations and they leave supervisors. And, and that's true in non-extraordinary times. But even now, I think, uh, if people don't leave, at least their lives are going to be incredibly miserable if they're not getting good trauma-informed supervision. And so those of you who are supervisors, please, please create predictable time set aside to talk with people. And we could go a whole lot more into this. Uh, I do Truth in Advertising teach a course on trauma-informed supervision, which I think is, is critically important, uh, especially during these times. But this is such a critical piece of what we do. All right. The last of these is hold the long view while examining what should change. And again, this feels again like one of those kind of uh, dilemmas that we focus on in both and situations. But we, we need to recognize that things are going to continue to change and expect that and navigate around it. And at the same time, we want to continue believing that this too shall pass. 
Um, I have a friend, former colleague, Vicki Steen, who says, yeah, this too shall pass, maybe like a kidney stone, but it will pass. Um, I, I think, yes, things will change, but we don't know in what ways and how. So we continue on. And I, I guess one of the, the, the gifts of this time is we're really learning to live in the moment in many ways and have less predictability about our futures which feels like we want to have, but are we ever really able to predict our futures? Uh, so maybe that's a whole new level of truth telling for ourselves going on. Right. So I'm gonna actually uh, just in the remaining 15 minutes have us uh, go to an even more practical level and invite you to participate in identifying some things that we can share with each other. So I think I need a, a new slide. So, um, but before we go on, any, let me just check comments here. Alina says, I'm interested in the course you mentioned about trauma-informed supervision. Can you tell us? Uh, could somebody behind the scenes just say more about that in the moment? Uh, it's offered as an online course. It used to be an on-site course, but, um, but we, yes, we, we can uh, tell you more about that. Uh, so promoting healthy teams, how do we do that? I, I found this image and I think it's, uh, I don't know if that's a healthy team, but I, I love what's happening there <laughs> in some ways, but they're pretty stressed out probably. Um, but I, I'm just gonna name some things, but I'm gonna ask you to type actively in the chat box things that you're also finding helpful to support teams so we can share all of those ideas. One place I think we should start is expecting people to developing the expectation that people are and will experience secondary trauma, call it secondary traumatic stress, call it vicarious trauma. Uh, we can name it by many things, but the fact is we know from the trauma literature that witnessing trauma from a, some distance is in many ways equally as impactful as having it experienced yourself. Now there's certainly exceptions to that, but witness trauma or just being alive in these days and times is going to be a time of secondary trauma. So let's acknowledge that and let's address it. And so I hope that all of your supervision sessions, team meetings are actually devoting some time just to saying, let's talk about how we're taking care of ourselves individually and as a team and what we could do better. And I, you're gonna be seeing a few suggestions coming up here. Certainly encouraging people to take their vacation comp days in a timely manner, I think is critically important. I have here something called holding virtual or social distancing team retreats. And um, I, I don't even know if you have retreats when we're not having the social distance, but I do believe retreats can take many forms, but there's something about stepping back from the here and now, what's right in our face, and going back to what is the mission of our organization? What is our own personal mission? What is it that we are good at and strong at? Where is it that we want to consider making changes? But the, the idea of the retreat here is to step back and enjoy each other's company, but it's also to use it in terms of stepping back and looking at these are changing times and how are we adapting. Flexible work schedules, uh, celebrating successes and accomplishments. And, and I would say celebrating not only successes and accomplishments, but also just the good stuff that people are happening in a routine way. And then why not have virtual or social distancing lunches and picnics and parties, yoga practice, um, there's all kinds of things that one can do, but I, I do think that's part of stepping away as well, is to just find time to be human with one another in a way that is you being you, not you being a worker all the time. Making sure that staff are able to provide input into practices and policies. I hope this is the case all the time, but in these days and times when things feel even more urgent, there's a tendency to not get input, and I get it. Sometimes things do need to be decided urgently, but I also believe that many things, when given 
a little bit more space and time, uh, the urgency can be let go and, and you can come up with better decisions overall. Certainly staff need to know how to go through formal channels to address concerns and grievances. Uh, we talked about diversifying caseloads. Uh, if you work with a, a situation or a, a number of people as a direct service provider and uh, they're all experiencing a tremendous amount of traumatic stress, uh, you know, there might be a need to, to find ways to ease that a little bit to share with others and to, to find caseloads that have a little more diversification to them. So the idea of providing opportunities for participating in social change activities, each, each of your organizations will see this differently perhaps, but I, I've always thought that as direct service providers, wouldn't it be great if we had 5% of our time that was devoted to, uh, five is an arbitrary number, but, but a percentage of time where we were expected to be involved in, in educating the public, in uh, demonstrating, if you will, in marching, and, and be reimbursed for it. Uh, maybe that takes some creative ways of looking at your reimbursement and all that, or maybe it's not possible, but I truly believe that when we are working in our little bubbles oftentimes, that when we are able to look beyond and see that there's movement taking place that we want to be, 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 be participating in, certainly as individuals, but also as employees, I think there's something tremendously freeing and rejuvenating about that. Right, come on in. Uh, I'd be really interested in if anyone has any thoughts about uh, how you've been doing that. I will say that uh, the organization I work for has made space for us to work, uh, or, or excuse me, to, to in a limited way participate in uh, community actions uh, around racism, in particular, uh, just because that's really important to us and, and also because uh, we, we want to, the, the organization wants to show support for it. So staff recognition programs, maybe you have them, maybe you don't, but this is a time, I think, to, to do that uh, for sure. Encouraging people to quote unquote go home early. I, I realize you might be already at home, but uh, I, I think in any situation where you've had an unusually tough day, it might just mean that you are told by your supervisor, please take the rest of the day off and do what you need to take care of, your, of yourself. Um, and then, of course, any access to wellness programs. I'd be interested in hearing what already kind of existing wellness programs are accessible to people during these times especially. Um, open door policies, administrative days. Uh, is it possible that if maybe the documentation, the paperwork, the review of uh, maybe your writing proposals, what, whatever it is, but would it be possible to take a day off for everybody just to work on those kinds of things as a, a stepping back kind of thing? Kim says, we started a parent support group via Teams chat every other week, yeah. Yeah, in my own organization, we've created these affinity groups, we call them, same, same kind of thing, around a lot of different topics. We have one on self-care, we have one on uh, nature and, and observing what's happening around us in nature. Uh, we have some on uh, supporting people who are living alone and having to work and live during these times. Uh, so I'm also seeing uh, these open chats or video messages. Yeah, this accessibility to have people voice what's going on. And book clubs, yeah, absolutely. What a, what a wonderful thing uh, that we can do. Um, TJ says, I found a charity I believe in and have been working up on my time off assisting their mission, yeah. So that, that's a really wonderful thing. And this is a time too when if we have the means to contribute to people who are doing good work. Um, and I, I would say just because of the, the situation we're in in particular, uh, you know, maybe particularly seeking out black owned businesses to provide or, or minority owned businesses to provide uh, our business to or to volunteer for Black-led organizations or advocacy organizations. Uh, Sarah's talking about siesta days. Yeah, yeah. 
intended be days with no productivity expectation. Clean your workspace, go to lunch together. Ooh, that sounds wonderful and, and very enlightened, I would say. <laughs> uh, two, so Kathy, we get two hours a week of physical activity leave. Huh. How about that? And three days a year of volunteer leave. Wonderful, wonderful. So it, what's nice about it is it's built in as an expectation of your job, right? It's not something you have to beg for or feel guilty about doing or have to spend your own private time doing it because it does fit with the mission of your organization in a broader sense. So beautiful examples. Thank you. Developing a buddy system uh, to pair newer staff with senior staff or just staff with staff at this point, right? Uh, equipping supervisors, coming back to that idea of providing trauma-informed supervision. And I'll just say a bit more about that. Uh, you know, supervision is supervision, and uh, to make it more trauma-informed, it's, it's really a matter of just weaving in the concepts that we know of both how the work that we do impacts us as care providers and leaders, but also how trauma impacts the people we're serving and recognizing that the services that we provide uh, need to take into account that trauma and not be re-traumatizing or further harming other people. So there's a, a number of variables going on, and I'm a big fan of supervisors supervising people in exactly the same way that they want their supervisees to treat clients, meaning that we listen well, we honor autonomy, we create safe space to talk. We have courageous conversations, and so on and so forth. All right. We are coming upon uh, closing time here, and I so appreciate your involvement. And, and this is actually going to be our next to last slide. But I'm, I'm curious about, out of all this, what's bubbling up for you? Uh, and, and maybe even identifying, if you would, what you would consider doing as a next step, leaving here today uh, from this call, and what you might do today yet, tomorrow, next week, uh, this summer, uh, to, to, to move in the direction of uh, supporting staff in maybe a new creative way, or maybe even continuing to do what you're doing, but maybe just paying more attentiveness to it. Uh, so, Donna, thank you for, yeah, sending this to your supervisor and, and talking about it with that person, right? Um, so, adding trauma informed supervision for our staff, yeah, say thank you. Uh, so, so, there's that, uh, there's, uh, if, if you are a supervisor, uh, maybe being more attentive to asking people, how are you doing, <laughs> or how are you doing? Uh, you can put the emphasis where you want. Uh, it might be also about uh, making sure people have equipment they don't have, a working computer, for example. Uh, but it also might be just listening to people and hearing their experience without trying to fix it, right? Just being in solidarity with them uh, in, in how they are and continuing to accentuate people's good things and strengths that they're doing. And being a little more forgiving, frankly, for when people forget a meeting or when they don't document exactly correctly. Now, I do get it. When there's patterns developing, that's to be addressed. But this is also a time to be a little more generous and forgiving, I think, for with each other. All right. So I'm going to uh, just say that uh, this is, again, referring back to the New England MHTTC, but um, please feel free to contact them. You also have my email here. I, I accept emails from people. That would be great if you want to ask a specific question. Or earlier you were given an email that you can contact C4 Innovations. But there's also lots and lots of other great resources in the New England area and around the, the, the states that uh, can assist you in, in doing this. But I'm just going to close by saying thank you so much for uh, what you are doing and for all of the, the good efforts you're making. And I trust that uh, you will continue to uh, hold hope in the midst of these times and uh, move that arc of the, 
the universe, the moral arc of the universe uh, towards justice uh, in, in whatever way you can. So thank you and 